I would like to tell you about uh, how we have developed some what we call genomic enzymology tools to uh, analyze sequence function space in large protein fa in protein families and use that information to try to assign function to unknown or uncharacterized proteins discovered uh, in genome projects. Uh, I, it's impossible for, for me now, and I, I should, should go into, I should say, uh, I'm not a bioinformatician. I am an enzymologist who realizes there is a lot to be mined in the uh, protein sequence databases, and the question is, how do you get to it, and how do you use, how do you use that intelligently? Uh, we use the uh, Uniprot database, even though we're in the United States, uh, and this is a plot of the growth of the uh, Uniprot database as a function of time. As of a couple of weeks ago, there was approaching 110 million sequences. Uh, in the Trumbull bit database, this is the automatic, automatically annotated part of Uniprot. In contrast, in Swissprot, there were about 500,000 500, sequences that are annotated. There, is, there are data on this slide that's basically on the x-axis. There is a large gap between, uh, and of course the Swissprot database is that which is manually curated by taking uh, information from the literature. So you can see that there is a huge gap between uh, the total number of sequences in the database and that for which there is experimentally determined uh, functional in 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 uh, information. Of course, by uh, sequence homology, you can extend uh, the uh, sequences for which we know data, for which we know function. But the problem is, uh, what are the sequence boundaries between function and how far can you take those annotations when you look at a protein family? So a number of years ago, uh, a group of us in the United States realized we needed to do something about this, and this required large-scale bioinformatics computation and ex experimental tools and strategies. And that project uh, was supported by uh, the National Institutes of General Medical Sciences. It was called the Enzyme Function Initiative. And this integrated, uh, as, as I've just said, it integrated bioinformatics, uh, uh, computational people, structural people, uh, enzo enzymologists and bio biologists with the goal of starting with a sequence, being able to start with a sequence and uh, determine both the in vitro enzymatic activity and the in vivo uh, biological function. Uh, NIH did not see the, uh, think that should be funded beyond five years. So we had a change in direc direction, directorship at the General Medical Sciences Institute and so we're now supported on a somewhat more modest scale uh, with a program project. Uh, with the support of both the Enzyme Function Initiative and now with the program project, uh, we are developing uh, web tools that, uh, for the construction of sequence similarity networks and genome neighborhood networks. And I want to tell you about those uh, today. Actually, we were, uh, the uh, staff at uh, National Institutes of General Medical Sciences insisted that we make these web tools or the ability to generate sequence similarity networks and genome neighborhood networks available to the community. Uh, uh, I think the craziest day in my life was when I said, gee, maybe we ought to make web tools and make these really easily publicly accessible, and I didn't quite realize uh, what the implications were of that statement, of, of that thought. Anyway, so um, last summer uh, I published a perspective in biochemistry uh, which gives an overview of these web tools for generating uh, sequence similarity networks and genome neighborhood networks. And as I said, I'd like to tell you very briefly about those today and then I'd like to give you uh, a recent application of how we've used sequence similarity networks and genome neighborhood networks to discover some uh, novel pathways uh, with very interesting enzymatic activities. Uh, if you would like to access uh, our web tools, all you have to do is Google EFI EST, and, and that is sufficient. And I'm, I'm actually, I actually know that a number of people who are at this meeting, and I'm quite excited about this, a number of people who are at this meeting uh, have already accessed or using these web tools. Uh, maybe that's the reason I got invited. Uh, if so, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm very much appreciative of that. So you don't have to remember the website, the, the URL. You can just Google EFI EST, and at least when I do that from here, it comes up as the first hit. Uh, so you, this will, it will take you to a page that looks uh, like this, and, uh, uh, and I'm going to talk now about the EFI EST web tool and the EFI GNT web tool before I give, a, uh, uh, as I said, an example of the use of these tools. Okay, so I want to tell you about the web, both of the web tools, and then I would like to tell you about a strategy that we are using to discover uh, novel catabolic pathways in bacteria, 
And I'm going to give you an example of this, and then I'm going to give you an indication of where we are heading in the way of web tools. And if any of you have suggestions for either how we might improve our web tools or additional web tools, uh, I'd be happy to uh, receive those suggestions. Okay, so um, sequence similarity networks in the EFI EST web tool. So P Patsy Babbitt, who was associated with the Enzyme Function Initiative, uh, popularized the use of sequence similarity networks to visualize uh, relationships across diverse protein families. Uh, probably all of you, uh, most of you, are familiar with phylogenetic trees for looking at uh, protein families. Uh, sequence similarity networks look quite different from those, and I would posit that these uh, look these are more user friendly with be able in being able to de define a, a potential isofunctional families. And so that is the using these sequence similarity networks. So again, here it's. What's the relationship between uh, phylogenetic and sequence similarity networks? The uh, phylogenetic tree. How are phylogenetic trees? These are constructed using multiple sequence alignments for all of the sequences that you want to put into the tree. Um, in contrast, how are sequence similarity networks generated? Well, first of all, what is a sequence similarity network? In a sequence similarity network, there are circles or nodes, and each one of those represents a protein sequence. And the nodes are connected by lines or edges that uh, quantitate uh, the uh, similarity between the sequences. Uh, we use something called an alignment score, which is related to the BLAST bit, uh, E value, not quite, but very close to it. And so I'm sure you're all familiar with the concept of expectation values from BLAST. So the value of the BLAST E value uh, is used to connect the edges, or connect the nodes. Uh, at a very permissive uh, threshold for sequence similarity, that is at a very large value for the uh, E value, all of the nodes will be connected to one another, but then as you restrict the sequence relationship, the sequence similarity between them, you'll begin to take away uh, edges. And so the nodes that were all originally in one hairball will be uh, uh, segregated into clusters. And when you do this, and actually the way we do this is by uh, BLAST E values. Uh, BLAST E values are much faster, pairwise E values are much faster to calculate than multiple sequence alignments for large numbers of proteins. Uh, when you do this, when you generate a sequence similarity network, uh, these look uh, very similar to the results of the trees. The same clusters that you see in the trees are present in the sequence similarity networks. Of course, this assumes uh, that you have selected an, an edge value threshold uh, that will allow these clusters to be uh, segregated into isofunctional groups. And I will say that is the hardest part of this exercise. Okay, you can access this web tool by going to the link to the EFI EST uh, button at the top of the page, and you'll see something that looks like this. Uh, and I, uh, there are, we, we now are providing four different options for generating sequence similarity networks. That is, we're providing four different methods to collect sequences that we then will use in an all-by-all -all blast to generate the, uh, to, to generate the network. Uh, you can collect sequences by a BLAST against the Uniprot database, and we, as I said, even though we're in the United States, we use the Uniprot database. Why do we use the Uniprot database? We use the Uniprot database because the annotations in Uniprot can be altered by or could by users. That's impossible with NCBI. Okay, so you can collect sequences by BLAST. You can collect sequences by specifying PFAM or Interpro families. You can collect sequences, or you can provide your own sequences with a FASTA file, or you can provide your own sequence with, uh, with uh, sequence IDs and uh, deposition IDs. So if, and on, this pa on the uh, page for e EFI EST, there are a number of tabs across the page. Uh, one of these is option A, this is option B, this is option C, this is option D. Uh, those of you who have, are using this tool, you may notice that these uh, pages are changing with time, and that's because we are actively trying to improve them, in, in, and we're trying to, uh, excuse me, increase the capabilities that are provided. Okay, so I uh, like to think about protein families. Option B uh, uses a user-specified PFAM or Interpro family. So all you have to do uh, to generate or to start the generation of a sequence similarity network for a protein family is 
put in the PFAM family, uh, and then uh, put in your email address and hit submit analysis. And then there are some a couple of steps that you have to follow, and ultimately you will get a file that you can download and uh, analyze or visualize in a program called Cytoscape. Cytoscape, which is, uh, uh, allows the visualization of large networks. Cytoscape also provides, uh, not in, as well as the network, it also provides what's called the data table. And in the data table, we provide annotations for each of the sequences that are present in the sequence similarity network. And these sequences are uh, various uh, uh, phylogenetic classifications. There are uh, also node attributes for various databases. And the idea is that you can use these node attributes to try to segregate your protein family into isofunctional groups uh, based on various kinds of information that may be available. Okay, so that's uh, the EFI EST web tool uh, in a very quick summary. Uh, the, I'd like to next talk about the EFI GNT web tool, which is uh, how you can use uh, the information in the sequence similarity network to collect genome neighborhood networks, the genome neighborhoods for each of those sequences. This, of course, is, can be done only for bacterial and fungal proteins, only for bacterial and fungal proteins are the local, is the uh, local genome neighborhood likely to include uh, a, bios, uh, a pathway, a catabolic or a biosynthetic pathway. So <clears throat> this comes back to the problem of um, uh, the sequence boundaries between function. If you have a sequence for which you know a function, and if you go to more divergent sequences, how divergent can those sequences become before you change the function, okay? And so, uh, if you have very high sequence similarity, maybe uh, greater than 70%, although this is an arbitrary number, uh, sometimes there are examples of sequences that only share 98%, that share 98 sequence identity and catalyze different reactions. But let's assume, uh, we assume uh, at a first pass that if sequences share greater than 70% sequence identity, you can probably extend an annotation. The problem is, what if you have lower levels of sequence identity? How might you go about annotating those sequences? And what we suggest is that by looking at genome context, as I said, for bacterial and, archaeal, or bacterial and fungal proteins, uh, you may be able to uh, use the... Uh, uh, to use that genome context to specify a, a new function or certainly to identify uh, functionally linked prote proteins and pathways that can be subjected to experimental characterization and pathway discovery. So the genome context is what uh, is provided by what we call genome neighborhood networks. So how, how are these constructed? So uh, these two clusters are from a, from a sequence similarity network. And what we do is we take those, the sequences in those clusters and we go to the European Nucleic Acid Database, the ENA database, and we retrieve the neighbors of each one of those sequences. Um, the default is we retrieve uh, neighbors plus or in a plus or minus 10 ORF window, but that can be varied. Uh, then we collect those neighbors and we assign those to PFAM families. And then we group the neighbors for each of the queries, each of the query clusters. Uh, into PFAM families, and we determine what is the percent co-occurrence for those PFAM families, and then we report back in a, in a genome neighborhood network for each cluster, we report back what are the most frequently occurring PFAM families, with the concept that these uh, most frequently occurring PFAM families may constitute a metabolic pathway in which the sequences in the original uh, sequence similarity network clusters are <coughs> involved. <coughs> So as I said, uh, you can hopefully, uh, the idea is that you can use these, this genome neighborhood network uh, to deduce a pathway from the identity of the neighboring PFAM families. Of course, it's useful. I'm a chemist. I'm an enzymologist. It's useful if you know something about chemistry because just because a protein is in a PFAM family doesn't mean you necessarily know exactly what the reaction is, but you likely know the kind of reaction, the kind of chemistry that is being catalyzed by members of those families by members of that family. So this, uh, the Genome Neighborhood Network tool can be accessed by this tab at the upper left-hand corner of our web page. And uh, all you have to do to, uh, or what you have to do to generate a Genome na Neighborhood Network 
is to input a sequence similarity network that you've generated with our web tool, perhaps edited, modified in some way using Cytoscape uh, to uh, uh, using Cytoscape. You'd select what neighborhood size, that is how many neighbors on either side of the query sequences in each one of the clusters do you collect. Uh, and then you, you specify uh, what is the co-occurrence frequency that you want to use as the minimum for specifying a functionally linked, uh, an important functionally linked uh, neighbor. And typically we use 20% and then you put in an email address and you click uh, go. And this is just an example, this is an example of an input sequence similarity network. What the GNN tool does is then uh, returns that network, except it has been a unique color and a unique cluster number has been assigned to each one of the clusters in the original sequence similarity network. And what you also get back is uh, a collection of, of these, these kinds of clusters in a network where the uh, hub node is the number of the query cluster, that is, which cluster in this sequence similarity network, and the spoke nodes are the most commonly occurring uh, PFAM families. And from these most commonly occurring PFAM families, this is how you might deduce pathways. Now, I will admit that this has been somewhat edited for simplification. It will report back transcriptional factors. It will report back uh, also transport uh, proteins. And I have removed those. I've edited those out to just get to the protein families that are involved in the pathway. But so for this, uh, for this query, which was a solute binding protein that bound ethanolamine, uh, we uh, identified four protein families that might constitute a catabolic pathway. And using some information, you know, using our intuition about chemistry, we could put together a pathway for the, uh, for the catabolism of ethanolamine. And I'm not going to go into any detail, but here are the four. We deduced that these would be the reactions catalyzed by the four PFAM families that were identified in the GNN. Now, recently, if you use our tool, you will have noticed that we also now provide the ability to visualize the genome neighborhood diagrams, that is, the individual genome neighborhood networks for each of the sequences in the clusters. So this allows you, instead of getting an overview of percent co-occurrence frequency, this allows you to look at the individual genome neighborhoods for each of the sequences in the clusters. Uh, this allows you then to uh, look at what, what uh, organisms, what species, uh, contain, might contain genes encoding the pathway so you can more easily select uh, proteins for functional characterization. And we are working to modify this. Like I said, we are, um, I'm not actually stealing money from a project which is not to be used for this to pay for a full-time programmer and because I think these are really important because they're, this functional annotation problem is not going to go away. It's only going to get worse. And so I do think that this is a worthwhile effort. Okay, so I want to now talk about the discovery of a pathway, and I'm going to talk about using solute binding proteins. So a number of years ago, the EFI published a paper about using solute binding proteins for transporters to discover pathways. Okay, why do we use solute binding, protein, uh, solute binding proteins for transporters to discover pathways? Uh, solute binding proteins will bind the ligand that is going to be catabolized by the pathway, so it'll be the substrate for the first enzyme in the pathway. The transport system and its solute bind binding protein are often co-localized in the genome with the catabolic pathway. So you quickly get from that solute binding protein what's the, what's the substrate for the first enzyme in the pathway, and from genome neighborhoods you get uh, the, the uh, other proteins that are involved in the pathway. So it's possible to easily screen uh, solute binding proteins on large scale. We have a, a library of perhaps 500 compounds that we use to screen solute binding proteins. And this is, just, this is done by uh, mixing the, uh, the solute binding proteins uh, with a ligand and then uh, subjecting these to thermal denaturation. And the idea is that you're looking for ligands that lead to uh, increased melting temperatures, that is, the ligands are binding and prevent uh, uh, denaturation. Okay, so in the remainder of my talk, I want to talk about uh, the discovery of pathways for of catabolic pathways for a compound called diapios. One of my graduate students put diapios in the ligand screen. I had no idea what diapios was, and I didn't know what it was until we got some hits, okay? 
Uh, so uh, one of the things I've learned in this project is you don't want to think too hard about what you do because something interesting will come out as long as you've got graduate students uh, who are just saying, but let's put this in the, in the library. Okay, so we discovered in a PFAM family for solute binding proteins for ABC transport systems, three solute binding proteins that were stabilized by apios as well as ribose and ribulose. This is very frequent that there is promiscuity in the specificity for ligands. So what did we do? We uh, t went to a, an encoding organism and we did knockouts of the solute binding protein and some of the proximal genes encoding the uh, enzymes. And what we discovered is when we did those knockouts, uh, apios, uh, these compounds, wild type could utilize these compounds as carbon source, but when we knocked out the genes, apios was no longer a carbon source, so clearly apios was the correct ligand. All right, so here is diapios. Diapios is a pentose. It's a branched pentose uh, with two hydroxymethyl groups. So where do you find diapios? And I think there's a lot of diapios here in, in Norway because you have a lot of trees. Diapios is part of Ramnogalacturon and 2. Uh, it is involved, which is a, uh, one of the abundant uh, polysaccharides in plant cell walls. Apios is, inv is involved in the cross-linking of cell walls through the formation of boronate esters. So that's diapios. Um, and the, I don't want to go into detail here. Diapios has been known, but there's never been a catabolic pathway for diapios. And we said, okay, uh, can we discover them? Okay, uh, and, the, and the bottom line is we've discovered five, all right, so, uh, which we were amazed about. And I want to tell you today about the discovery of four of those. So here is the sequence similarity network for PFAM13407. This is the solute binding protein family. Uh, this is that contain the, uh, these three uh, solute binding proteins that bind diapios. So this is the, this is the sequence similarity network for the, that contain those three solute binding proteins. This, is, this network was constructed at about 60% sequence identity, so these uh, solute binding proteins appear to be orthologous. They're, they're in the same, uh, in the same uh, sequence similarity net network cluster, and there are, those, there are the three proteins. Now, when we uh, run this cluster through the, e through the, the EFI GNT tool, we get back a colored network, uh, and this is uh, cluster one. And if we look at the uh, abundant PFAM fi families that are proximal to cluster one, we see a lot of enzymes, uh, too many enzymes to generate a catabolic pathway. If we now uh, construct a sequence similarity network or take that network and go to a higher percent identity that's required to draw edges, this partitions into two clusters, okay, a red cluster and a yellow cluster. And when we do that, we see that the uh, genome neighborhoods of these clusters, of these now part separated clusters, are much simpler. Turns out that the red cluster encodes one catabolic pathway, the, the yellow cluster uh, in, encodes three catabolic pathways, which we have deconvoluted. Okay, so what is the red cluster? What, are the, what is the pathway that the red cluster is in? Well, if you look at the neighbors, they're <clears throat> Excuse me, there's a, there are, there's a heterodimeric transketolase, there's a kinase, and an isomerase. And uh, I'm going to assure you that we have done all of the experiments. I'm only going to show you the pathways. This, this is about to appear in Nature Chemical Biology. So there are experiments that back up everything I'm telling you that, I'm, that, I've, that we've, we've discovered. Okay, so what is this pathway? This pathway is that apios is phosphorylated to make apios 4-phosphate. There's then an isomerase which makes apios into apulose 4-phosphate, and then there's a transketolase that takes the top two carbons of apulose 4-phosphate, uh, attaches that to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, and you get xylose 5-phosphate and dihydroxyacetone phosphate. So the reason this pathway can be used for apios catabolism is you've gone into the pentose phosphate pathway and into glycolysis. Okay, what about this yellow cluster? Uh, what, what pathways are encoded by this yellow cluster? Well, if you look at this, uh, there are two dehydrogenases. Uh, these, even though these are in separate clusters, these are the same uh, family of dehydrogenases, and here's a second family of dehydrogenases. So what are these dehydrogenases? The first one, the red one, is apios dehydrogenase, which takes apios and uh, oxidizes it to apionolactone. And then, even though it hasn't been curated as a PFAM family, there is a proximal 
uh, apianolactinase, which opens this lactone to apionate. Okay? So uh, the apiose is converted to deapionate. Uh, what does the second uh, dehydrogenase do? Well, the second dehydrogenase does something that's actually fairly amusing. The second dehydrogenase takes deapionate, which was, I told you just how we got to deapionate, and then in an, ADP, in, in, in an NAD plus dependent fashion, the two hydroxyl group is oxidized, and then one of the hydroxymethyl group migrates to form this, uh, this now beta keto acid. And we don't know if this is a concerted migration of the hydroxymethyl group or if this is stepwise, stepwise via the formation of formaldehyde, but the bottom line here is deapionate is converted to uh, isoapionate uh, or isooxoapionate. Okay, now if we take the, uh, do a sequence similarity network for this uh, oxidoisomerase, as we call it, we're calling this an oxidoisomerase. If we take the sequence similarity network for this, uh, partitioned or, uh, with edges removed if the alignment, if the percent identity is less than 70 percent, we get two clusters. Okay, what are the pathways, and this is the genome neighborhood network for the two clusters, what do we get for pathways? Well, in the red cluster, we get uh, a member of the xylose isomerase family, we get a member of the triose phosphate isomerase family, and we get a member of the ribose isomerase family. What are these? Well, it turns out that the xylose isomerase fa family de uh, decarboxylates this beta keto acid that was produced by the oxidoisomerase to make L erythrulose. L -erythrulose. The kinase phosphorylates that to make this erythrulose phosphate. The triose phosphate isomerase does a 1 2 proton uh, isomerization like the normal triose phosphate isomerase does. And then the, uh, ribulose phosphate, the ribulose phosphate isomerase does, a, again, a ketose aldose isomerization. And this generates erythrose 4-phosphate. So <clears throat> what we have in this pathway is diapiose is converted again to an intermediate in the pentose phosphate pa pathway in using a reaction that involves uh, decarboxylation. Okay. The, um, What's the other cluster? The other cluster, one of my favorite words is amusing. The, uh, this cluster is much more amusing, okay? Because there's some very interesting, uh, a couple of very interesting enzymes in this that are uh, involved in these pathways. This is actually two pathways, whoops. This encodes uh, two pathways. Okay, one of the uh, neighbors is the Rubisco family, the Rubisco superfamily. And I have been interested in some time in the Rubisco superfamily because the Rubisco superfamily isn't only Rubiscos, it catalyzes other reactions that uh, involve the stabilization of ene dilate intermediates, which is sort of the central way that the Rubis Rubisco works. <coughs> so even though I wasn't wanting to uh, study the Rubisco family, this, uh, these solute binding proteins for apios brought us back to the Rubisco superfamily. So this is a sequence similarity network of the Rubisco, uh, of the Rubisco superfamily and a bunch of clusters. Uh, three of these are Rubiscos. For, uh, form one Rubisco, form two Rubisco, form three Rubisco, and you're presumably all aware that Rubisco catalyzes the carboxylation of ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate uh, via an enolization, a carboxylation reaction, and then a hydrolysis of this ketone to generate two molecules of 3-phosphoglycerate. Okay, this, um, the other proteins, the other clusters are Rubisco-like proteins. They are not Rubiscos. So the magenta uh, cluster catalyzes a reaction called 2,3-dichetophy-methylthioribulose-1-phosphate uh, tautomerase. Uh, what is this? This is, uh, so actually this is in a pathway for methionine salvage that is in Rhodospirillum rubrum that we discovered and described several years ago. And what this, uh, what this isomerase, what this tautomerase does, I'm sorry, I said this wrong. This is in the methionine salvage pathway for species of bacilli. This is the canonical methionine salvage pathway. And what this Rubisco-like protein does is just catalyze this uh, tautomerization reaction to make this, um, this enol that's stabilized by conjugation to this carbonyl group. And this is done by proton abstraction to generate an enolate anion. The cyan proteins here uh, in, are involved in the methylthio d ribulose 13 isomerase. This is in an alternate pathway for methionine salvage that is in uh, Rhodospirillum rubrum, uh, and it ends up taking the carbon part, the, 
the ribose part of the, the substrate into deoxyxylus 5 phosphate and isoprenes. And what this enzyme does is catalyzes two 1 2 proton isomerization reactions, so the carbonyl group migrates down two carbons from carbon 2 to carbon 4. Again, rubisco like chemistry. Okay, so this, is, uh, this cluster is the cluster that has neighbors uh, of the oxidoisomerase that I told you about in which this hydroxymethyl group migrated, okay? So what are these? Because this is the ones that we're after. So if you go to a larger alignment score, a greater percent sequence identity that's required to draw edges, uh, this cluster segregates into several, uh, several clusters. One of them, and two of these are large and contain these that are neighbors of this oxidoisomerase. So what are these? Okay, so we can generate a genome neighborhood network for this cluster. And what do we see? Uh, we see triose phosphate isomerase and the ribose phosphate isomerase. Gee, we've seen those before. I told you that the triose phosphate isomerase and ribose phosphate isomerase were involved in a pathway to make erythrose 4-phosphate that involved a decarboxylation reaction. Well, it turns out that in uh, this pathway, uh, this product of the oxidoisomerase is phosphorylated, and then the rubisco-like protein does a decarboxylation reaction. In general, rubisco, rubiscos and rubisco-like proteins use ketose 1-phosphates as substrates. And so this generates a ketose 1-phosphate. That ketose 1-phosphate then undergoes a decarboxylation reaction, makes this erythrolose phosphate that's isomerized in two steps to deerythrose 4-phosphate. Uh, so this does a decarboxylation reaction, catalyzed by a homolog of rubisco. Uh, uh, so there's, and it involves a stabilized ene dilate intermediate, as in the rubisco reaction. So what we have here, I told you that there was a xylose isomerase that was a decarboxylase for this product of the oxidoisomerase. We now have an alt, and this, this was followed by phosphorylation. We now have a pathway where phosphorylation occurs first, followed by a decarboxylation with the rubisco-like protein, and they give the same product, which is deerythrose 4-phosphate. So we have basically variants of the same pathway. Okay, and what about the uh, upper left-hand one? So this has a very simple uh, genome neighborhood network. It has a, the oxidoisomerase that makes this, uh, this, uh, this isomerized uh, apionate, and it has a kinase, or it has an apionate dehydrogenase and oxidoisomerase that give you that uh, isomerized uh, oxidoisomerase, and then a kinase, and that's all it has. Okay, so it turns out what this does is uh, this pathway takes, again, the product of the oxidoisomerase. There's the kinase to phosphorylate it. And then this rubisco-like protein, and I think this is remarkable, takes this phosphorylated beta-keto acid, does a decarboxylation reaction, generates carbon dioxide, and then uses that carbon dioxide to carboxylate the adjacent carbon of the substrate. So you generate, you've migrated the carboxylate group from this carbon to this carbon. This generates a ketone, which then can be hydrolyzed to form glycolate and 3-phosphoglycerate. Okay, uh, the rubisco itself does a carboxylation of a, an ene dilate to make a ketone, which is then hydrolyzed to generate uh, two carboxylic acid products. So this does ex uh, the same thing, except on a different substrate. Okay, so the transcarboxylase, as I said, does a decarboxylation to make a, a sequestered carbon dioxide. This then is used to uh, carboxylate the adjacent carbon. This, this ketone is then hydrolyzed and you generate glycolate and 3-phosphoglycerate. So both halves of these molecules, so this explains how this molecule uh, can be used as uh, a carbon source. So what we have are two rubisco-like proteins in the, in, uh, the catabolic pathways for apios. Uh, one of them decarbox, they use the same substrate, one of them does a decarboxylation reaction, the other one does this transcarboxylation hydrolysis reaction, so they are uh, functionally distinct uh, enzymes, rubisco, members of the rubisco-like super, the rubisco superfamily. So uh, we've actually uh, discovered a transketolase pathway that I've told you about, and actually that transketolase pathway is present in the human gut microbiome. Species of Bacteroides can generate apios by hydrolysis of Rhamnogalateron and 2 
And some of them, but not all of them, can have this transketolase pathway for using apios. And then I've told you about these three oxidative pathways uh, that I, uh, the, these three oxidative pathways. Okay, I, I just want to say that we are trying to do other things. Uh, we, are about, we are developing another tool, uh, which we call shortbread chemically guided functional profiling. And with this, we are collaborating with Emily Balskis and Kurt, Curtis Huttenauer at Harvard. Um, about a year ago in science, they, discovered, they uh, described a strategy for prioritizing members of families based on uh, occurrences and uh, abundances in metagenomes. And what they, would do, what they did was to generate a sequence similarity network and then uh, quantitate the abundance of the proteins in uh, the metagenome. They would map that to the sequence similarity network for a protein family so that you could then direct your target, uh, target selection, functional identification, uh, not sort of randomly within a protein family, but the most abundant members of the protein family in the metagenome that you're working with. So this is, we're actively underway with this. So with that, I'm going to close. And so this is, uh, as I said, this has been supported by two projects, the Enzyme Function Initiative and also a program project grant. These are people at Illinois who have been involved, people at UCSF who have been involved, people at Albert Einstein. I should say that Patsy was involved in the, the sequence similarity networks. These, uh, these folks here are computational biologists. Steve Elmo is a, a structural biologist, and I just mentioned Emily and Curtis. So I'd like to thank them, and then I'd like to close by thanking you for your attention, and I'd be happy to try to answer any questions. Thank you, John, for showing us how by uh, using innovative bioinformatics tools you can get a lot of interesting chemistry out of our genomes. Um, the talk is open for questions. Dick. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you very much. That was actually very interesting. Um, I, I was wondering what your genomic network tool gives you as an output if the neighbors are consistently hypothetical proteins. Well, then you've got a problem. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so it'll, two things will happen. If they're hypo hypothetical, does that mean not a member of a PFAM family? Potentially. Okay. If they're not a member of a PFAM family, they will be collected into, I've told you I've I showed you a simplified output. There will be a spoke node in the real networks you generate that will be for no PFAM family. You can take the accession IDs for those. You can generate another sequence similarity network using option D of our tool. And when you do that, you will generate a sequence similarity network only for those hypotheticals. Uh, the Interpro database, PFAM is one family uh, that's used in the Interpro databases. There are t 11 other families. So if there is no PFAM family designation, there may be another family designation that you will see when you generate uh, the secondary sequence similarity network of the no PFAM families. Uh, if you've Hopefully, if you've got a hypothetical, and actually this lactinase that I told you about, that was a hypothetical. And we found that in the nuns, and it's also easy to find it in the genome neighborhood diagrams now that we offer those, that you can see that there is this hypothetical close by. And so if you look at the chemistry, you may say, gee, as we did, we need a hydrolase, we need a lactinase, and there it is. Thank you. Over there? Back in the, yes. Yeah. Let me just say, this, this is supposed to help you out. It's not supposed to solve your problems for you. <laughs> <laughs> there, there still has to be some, some thinking. Uh, Please, yeah. Even we have to think, right? and it's hard. Hi. Sorry. Thank you. No, no worries. Um, so we've used sequence similarity networks, and it, it's extremely useful. And thanks for a very, uh, very insightful talk. Uh, we've tried to use 
structural information with those. And you mentioned structural information on enzymes. It didn't seem to help much in our case. So I was wondering what's your experience with using either uh, models or structural information coming directly from the PDB? So um, my collaborators in San Francisco, Andre Shali, Brian Choiquet, and uh, Matt Jacobson, they have worked on developing uh, what they call um, integrative pathway mapping, where they generate homology models. Let's say you believe you know what proteins are involved in a pathway. Um, if there are sufficiently close pro PDB structures for those proteins, they can model the, st the, the structure of the protein. And then they do in silico ligand, ligand docking to predict what is the best binding member of an in silico library of ligands. And then they use chemoinformatic methods to try to identify a pathway best based upon the, the hit lists, if you will, to each of those, those proteins. And we recently published in eLife a, a, a paper describing the discovery of a pathway using uh, docking to homology models uh, to fill out the pathway. Okay. Um, again, it's work, but it's certainly uh, possible to do this based upon models. We certainly have predicted correctly the functions of several proteins based upon docking to homology models. Of course, the question is, that the key thing is, what's in your library? What's in your in silico library? In silico libraries can be much, much larger, of course, than um, real libraries, chemical libraries. So that's why we would like to be able to use in silico libraries. And we're trying to do this now for some pathways in um, the microbiome. Don, I think it's you. Yeah. Over there, on the hill, yeah. John, can you take this huge amount of information and learn something about the evolution of the pathways, how the individual pathways changed over time or became more complicated? Uh, I suspect that you could. Uh, you've sort of hit a raw nerve in a way. Don and I are friends from a long time ago, okay? I think we're still friends. <laughs> Uh, sequence similarity networks by themselves, uh, you have to use very carefully, if at all, for trying to deduce evolutionary relationships. Uh, phylogenetic trees are much to, to be much preferred for that. Um, the problem becomes how do you generate phylogenetic trees unless you're an expert on phylogenetic trees. And we've been so crazy, I left this out. Janine, who is going to speak after me, has been working with Patsy Babbitt to on some protein families. And we would very much like to be able to generate uh, trees for large protein families so that we might be able to connect sequence similarity network clusters to figure out what's, what's close and how these might have evolved from one another. Because at one level, you, we're interested in functional assignment, but then, of course, there's also this interest in evolution. You know, how it is, for example, why it is that there are four catabolic pathways for apios, we have no clue. Uh, they certainly are in different classes of organisms, but you know how these all got started. I don't know what the relationship is to the to the closest uh, to other pathways. The succedo isomerase that I told you about uh, it seems to be all its own family, and so how that family got started, I don't know. You know, as Frank Westheimer would say, for reasons known only to God and not to me. And one final question from the room, and then I have a question myself. Go ahead. How well do they work with multi-domain proteins? Yeah. Well, you, you certainly will generate sequence similarity networks irrespective of what domains are present, okay? And from, our, from my experience, multi-domain proteins will tend to cluster with Multi, with the same multi-domain proteins. But you, you have to be very careful with sequence similarity networks. We report what protein families are present in each one of the sequences that's, that's in the sequence similarity network. So you can certainly figure out which proteins are multi-domain proteins. Um, 
But I would just say you have to use these carefully. Just one final question for me. Um, I was just wondering a simple, actually a simple thing. If we take, if you annotate the genome and you use 70% cutoff for functional similarity, what would the error rate be? And how much would that error rate be reduced by using genome context? Would you have any numbers? I, ha I, ha I have no numbers whatsoever. Um, I, have no, I don't know. Because no. like I said, some proteins uh, that catalyze the same reaction and participate in the same pathways might uh, be related as low as 15% sequence identity, or it might be 90% sequence identity. Even within the same protein family, uh, there is no uniform uh, value for what causes functions to separate. As I said, this is not a simple problem, and all we, tr well, all we were trying to do based upon, um, you know, to tr or trying to do is to develop some things to, to help. And that's all we've, that, and so that's what we've done. Thank you for that. Sure. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you again for your talk. We have a little present from the organizers.